Hey, Unexplained Ones, this is Dr. Mounts from All Things Unexplained. We talk about everything from Bigfoot to UFOs to astrophysics and everything in between. So if that sort of thing is for you, give us a follow on social media and follow us wherever you podcast. Remember, this podcast is made possible by listeners like you. If you'd like to help us out, you can do so on Venmo at Bigfoot UFO. All Things Unexplained, hosted by Dr. Mounts. Let's face it, we were always ready to roll without him anyway. <laughs> CJ Derringer. Ain't nobody perfect, right? And Smitty Neves. I've never planned out hardly anything my whole life. I just free ball. Featuring Cajun Man. I'm just old nobody, somebody looking for somebody. Authorities are investigating a string of mysterious cow deaths along OSR Highway. And tonight, there are new questions about where exactly these happened. What exactly is going on here? This was first reported by the Madison County Sheriff that they had one incident and five others were in neighboring counties. Today, Robertson County did confirm they had one incident, almost identical to what Madison County described. The cows had the hide near their mouse and jaw removed. There was no tire tracks, footprints, or blood surrounding the cows. We've reached out to the Madison County Sheriff's Office for clarification. After news broke last week about these cow mutilations and with no suspects being named, some conspiracy theories have begun to emerge. Authorities say the cow died in a very mysterious way, this leaving many residents in Madison County unsure about the situation. It's very questionable in my mind, the way that I understand uh, that they were mutilated with no blood, their tongues, uh, and no struggle. The unusual situation has drawn nationwide attention. Some are even pointing to aliens. As far as the aliens, naturally, I don't know, but there's an awful lot of things that's going on in our universe that may, I'll just say, accidentally point us in the direction of the big gigantic question mark. What exactly is going on here? In a Facebook post, the Sheriff's Office claimed similar incidents have been reported across the United States. They will get caught and they need to because this is just atrocious to understand. Wow, what exactly is going on here? <laughs> Hello, all you <laughs> unexplained ones out there. If you're watching us live, you just saw the coolest ventriloquist act out of Dr. Mountains. It was like your lips weren't moving, but you were talking with that new intro. <laughs> Power of technology, CJ. Yes, it's pretty incredible. We're here. We're live. We're going to make this happen. This is a show on cattle mutilation. We had hoped to have a cattle mutilation expert with us, and who knows? He might still jump in and join us, and he's welcome to do that. We had Christopher O'Brien all set up to join us on our show. However, due to some technical difficulties... He's not with us at the moment, which means that I have to talk about mutilated cows, which is not exactly um, my forte. Ugh. We can do this. Help me out. That's right. We did have an expert coming on, Chris O'Brien. He's not quite here yet, but you never know. He might jump in with us. Not sure what's going on. He was definitely scheduled and set to come on with us. Maybe you can tell our listeners a little bit more about Christopher Oh, yeah. Ryan. Yes. So he would have been the perfect person to have come on and talk to us about cattle mutilation, which of course plays into so many of the shows that we've done in the past with UFOs, uh, Skinwalker Ranch, the people that we chatted with, they of course have had some cattle mutilations there too. And then this story that's coming out of Texas. So anyways, Christopher is an author, a researcher. He's the leading expert in this mysterious phenomenon of cattle mutilation for over two decades now. He's been investigating and documenting these cases, writing books about it, giving talks about it, studying the patterns, and trying to unravel the mystery behind 
what many consider to be one of the most puzzling and perplexing phenomena in the field of paranormal research. And it really is puzzling when you get down to the details of all of these mutilations. There's a lot of similarities. Things are done with surgical precision. They just don't seem like normal loss of life on a ranch or farm. So he's been on all kinds of things, um, different radio shows, Coast to Coast AM. He's been on History Channel's UFO Hunters and Discovery Channel's Unsolved Mysteries. So we do hope that uh, he he join, jumps on and joins us here tonight. And maybe he will. But if yeah. not, you know what? We're fully prepared to talk a little bit more about cattle mutilations and some recent news on cattle mutilations. And CJ, apparently cattle mutilation reports date back to the 60s and were apparently kind of a widespread phenomenon in the mm. 70s, which I find very interesting. Seems to coincide too with some UFO sightings. There were lots of UFO sightings, it seems, in the 70s. So not to say that they're related because I have no idea, but certainly that is a theory that people have posited. Well, the interesting thing is there are kind of a succinct set of theories for what's behind cattle mutilations. And by the way, if we just had to define a cattle mutilation as opposed to just an animal death, it's something like this, a phenomenon where cattle are found dead with strange injuries, such as the removal of organs or body parts with surgical precision, and often with no blood or footprints around the site. And I think that that's really the key to what makes a cattle mutilation a cattle mutilation as opposed to just another animal death, and that is this apparent surgical precision of something done to the body, right? right. And lack of blood and lack of evidence of other animals. Yes, and also another thing is that seems to be common in these instances is that there's no vultures or anything trying to get to the body afterwards. You think that if an animal just died of natural causes, what's going to happen? Okay, all of these vultures and things are going to come in as the body's decomposing. And that's not happening either. So you've got the surgical precision, no blood, no vultures coming in. What's happening? Right. I mean, and so... There are theories about this, and I mean, they range from pretty out there to pretty pedestrian. So one theory is, of course, could be natural causes. And CJ, I know you know you have dear friends and loved ones who have ranches. And I know you have some personal experience, or at least can relay their personal experiences with animal deaths by natural causes. So what are we yeah. looking at? I mean, yeah, of course, animals die all the time, various different things. In some case, you know, it could be simple as um, giving birth, right? A lot of animals die after giving birth. A lot of new animals die after they are born. Natural causes, absolutely. But those things are usually clear cut. They know what's happening. They know they're about to lose an animal. A lot of animals, of course, have to be put down for various different reasons. Um, it is, it's not common that several animals would go down at the same time, unless of course some disease was running through the herd, but then you wouldn't have tongues cut out and organs removed and other things that there's worth, like there's things I can't even say that I've learned that I'm like, I can't say that out loud. Well, and your aunt has an alpaca farm, right? And they recently lost some animals. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They. I have family that are alpaca ranchers and of course, they lose animals here and there. They recently lost one to a mountain lion, but there were signs that they lost it to a mountain lion. They, the mountain lion had gone for the neck and there was certainly blood shed from that. So uh, for an animal just to be inexplicably dead with all of its organs removed, other body parts removed, genitalia and such, that would be a major red flag that authorities needed to get involved. Any of your family call authorities? Oh, no. And they say found no, a no. dead al alpaca? No. that There would be no reason to do that. There, 
you know, nothing is was has ever been off with their animal deaths. Now, if they saw something unusual that made no sense, then maybe. And typically, I will say most ranchers, etc., are not quick to call authorities on anything. You know, they all kind of carry their own firearms and protect their own property in various different ways. So to call authorities means something is definitely up. I was just reading about one that took place in Oregon a couple of years ago. Everybody always says there's not one drop of blood, which seems crazy to have these cows that are, in this case, it was just the hide that was left. Hey, we've got him. There you go. Hey, thanks for joining us. We're certainly glad that you uh, have joined us and jumped in here. We were doing our best to give some history of cattle mutilations, but we are not the right people for that. So we're glad that you are here and can share a bit about us. I shared your bio with everybody in mm-hmm. terms of you know, what you've done in the past and what makes you such an expert here. But do us a little favor here. Tell us a little bit about cattle mutilation and, um, and how it differs from ordinary animal deaths. Uh, yeah, uh, geez, that's a big, big one. Um, basically, it's a head of livestock or uh, the warm-blooded animal, because not only cattle have been found in this condition, but uh, horses, pigs, goats, deer, antelope, elk, uh, bison. Uh, the list goes, you know, is is pretty long. Of, the kinds of animals that have been found in this condition, but but they're found missing their soft tissue organs, um, which are the fastest regenerating tissues in the body and harbor the most recent residual elements of the environment um, within their tissues. And um, so you're talking about the reproductive organs, uh, the tongue, uh, you know, the milk uh, producing organs, uh, you know, any any of the uh, areas that humans get cancer in the most, uh, actually, uh, which is is a is a an element, a, a, a kind of a correlation. I, I don't think very many people really take into account, but uh, generally, if, if it's a if it's a, a pink skin area, a soft tissue organ area, that that's where we uh, humans get cancer uh, uh, the most. And uh, I don't need to, to to go into details about how awful cancer can be, uh, but right. these animals are found uh, missing a combination of these organs there's no clues left behind uh tire tracks footprints cigarette butts uh, uh things of this sort like crime scene evidence uh left behind mm-hmm. and generally the rancher uh doesn't hear anything his dogs don't bark i've had cases where right. they've actually left a cow on the porch and the rancher's family uh and the rancher didn't wake up and and here at the dogs never bark. Um, so, you know, it's a very mysterious thing. And, and oftentimes when these uh, cases happen, and I, I think it's as high as uh, 90% of the cases that occurred, uh, occur are not reported by the rancher and his family, uh, just because they don't want to taint themselves with the uh, you know, with the stigma of of being, you know, singled out and selected uh, to have one of these, uh, one of their cattle uh, taken in this right. manner. So um, another thing that, that's often uh, reported is that the, well, the animals uh, is obviously was is dead, but um, there's really no cause of death in a lot of these cases. Um, there are exceptions to that rule, but 
but um, for the most part, yeah, uh, they can't really determine a cause of death. Uh, the, the animals uh, don't appear to leave signs of a struggle on the ground. When a, when a, a large uh, animal, uh, like a cow or a horse, dies, it, it thrashes around its legs. Will, will will kick and, and and kind of create a whirling motion uh, as it tries right, to get up and um, these are the types of, of crime scene evidence uh, um, details that uh, are easy to spot if you know what you're looking at and um, nine times out of ten there's no death struggle uh, that's mm. um, that's indicated by by what's left behind so. I think that, in a nutshell, is is what we call a classic uh, uh, mutilation. Now, the thing that that is the telltale sign of a classic mute often is the mandible flesh is pulled off the jawbone or sliced, like with a sharp implement, around the jawbone, around the bottom of the mandible. The flesh is missing. The skin, the hide, is missing. The jawbone is often left in a in a, a, a polished condition, where there's absolutely no tissue, no blood, no indication of uh, of uh, any flesh, you know, that have been there even hours before. Um, you can take a jawbone, for instance, and put it in a a pot of boiling lye solution on a stove and boil it, and you can't duplicate that particular polished oh, wow. look. Uh, so. When you see the ones with the real polished uh, jawbone, those are the spooky ones generally, and and the ones that are uh, the most disconcerting, I think, for law enforcement, for veterinarians, for for ranchers. A lot of ranchers, as we know, are outdoors people uh, to the extent where they even taxidermists. They they can do their own butchering, and uh, right. when they see things that don't conform to the to the norm, uh, it's it's pretty uh, you know it's readily apparent to them that uh, something unusual has happened to that particular head of livestock. So this is um, this is a mystery I I personally have been investigating uh, for thirty years. Yeah, tell us why. How did you get involved in investigating these <laughs> mutilations? <laughs> oh man, sometimes I wonder. Um, <laughs> we had a, a, a mini wave of UFO sightings in South Central Colorado, where I was living at the time, mm. in the San Luis Valley, and uh, uh, I had a New Year's Eve party on uh, New Year's Eve, nineteen ninety-two, and I had about thirty people over, which was a, a sizable percentage of the community. I think that this may be the <laughs> wildest New Year's Eve party story. Ever. Well, uh, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> well, I was DJing. We were dancing up a storm and having a great time. And uh, I, at the time, I was in a country band, which I, I hate to admit it. Uh, but um, nothing wrong with country. <laughs> <laughs> there is a fine play in it. <laughs> um, and I, I hadn't been around uh, a couple, three weekends prior to this in uh, I think it was the first weekend of December and that night we had uh, a really spectacular UFO sighting which uh, as it turns out I, I found I think 18 people out of the town of less than 200 that saw this uh, these two objects come down and uh, and at one point during the, the New Year's Eve party I was going around and kind of eavesdropping on you know people's conversations and at four or five or six uh groups of people were talking about these ufo sightings that i had heard about but i i didn't really pay much attention to it and uh so i so i'm thinking to myself wait a minute maybe there's something to this and so as i'm listening i'm kind of jotting down some notes and uh uh finally at the uh towards the end of the party i brought everybody together and i said hey do you you guys realize that you all probably saw the same event and somebody said oh that was the night there was a cattle mutilation in the you know, the county south of us and uh and i was off to the races i mean uh you know that that, that was <laughs> that was too good to be true right so yeah. so i i started looking into it and uh 
I called the rancher up and he described, you know, what had happened to his, his, uh, his cow. And, and, um, so, you know, armed with my notes from my interviews, uh, which I, you know, I went in and, and actually, uh, did some fairly extensive interviews with uh, a number of the witnesses who were willing to talk um, about the UFO sightings. And I went to my little local paper and said, hey, I think we have a, a pretty interesting, uh, you know, news story here. And she said, yeah, 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 write up something. Don't make it over 500 words. And, <laughs> and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see if we're going to publish this. And, uh, and so I went to the local sheriff and... Uh, the local university, and uh, I talked to some veterinarians and state patrol and county sheriffs. And by the, uh, you know, I didn't have to have the article turned in for a number of days, like a week and a half, I think two weeks. And so by the time I turned my article in, I had uncovered enough material to write a book. I mean, it was like oh, this God. treasure trove of of historical accounts and newspaper clippings. And by this point, I had met uh, over the phone, uh, Linda Howe, um, Tom Adams, uh, Gary Massey, uh, a little later on, David Perkins, uh, who, who were the main cattle mutilation researchers uh, prior to my getting involved in 92. Uh, Tom and, and Gary and David had been involved since the mid 70s. Linda had been involved uh, since uh, eight, 79, 80. Um, she taught, taught me over the phone, gave me a crash course and how to interview ranchers uh, properly, which I'll be forever grateful for, uh, for her help and advice. And um, I turned my article in, it was uh, 1,500 words, uh, three times longer than it was supposed to be. And because I done, I guess I'd done such a good job, she made it a front page article and it ran, I think, oh, wow. three pages or something. <laughs> and nice. uh, uh, wouldn't you know it, it got picked up by the Associated Press and uh, it went all over the world. I had to get a larger mailbox and... <laughs> I was on national TV within three months, so that's that's how I got involved in all this. Yeah. Incredible! That's amazing. Now, Chris, you you brought you kind of went into something that I wanted to know about. As far as you know, what is the genesis of cattle mutilations? How far back does this go to your knowledge? What was case, you know, Alpha, for example? Well, I've heard of of. Um, supposed accounts that extend back to the Middle Kingdom of Egypt. Uh, I've never been able to find documentation of uh, villagers petitioning the pharaoh uh, to have the gods conduct rituals to stop the uh, demons or the jinn or the gods to come down and, and grab their livestock and, and uh, kill their livestock. Uh, which sounds, you know, plausible, but uh, until I, until I actually find documentation that that shows that, I'm not going to use that as as a, you know, as my my departure point, if you will. But I have found uh, uh, documentation from 1606 from London, England, uh, in the court wow. court records of James the First, where hundreds of sheep were being mutilated uh, in single single events and, and uh, a bunch of cases where it wasn't quite a hundred, but it was uh, dozens and dozens of sheep were being uh, targeted and their inner parts, uh, their tallow and their tallow and inward parts were taken their the meat and the, the, the wool left behind. And I love the last sentence of the uh, entry. It says, of this sundry conjectures, but most would agreeeth, it tendeth toward fireworks. Whatever the, <laughs> you, <laughs> uh, you know, you can take that several different ways. I've <laughs> yeah, I guess. Uh, fireworks. I mean, if you think about beams of light. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, tallow was for you know eons for many years was the one of the main ingredients to make gunpowder. 
So, uh, but it doesn't make sense. Why would somebody go out and slaughter hundreds of sheep to get the tallow uh, for the purposes right. of making gunpowder? So maybe it was some sort of uh, weird joke. I mean, at, at, when this happened, James I had only been uh, king for a matter of months. The Guy Fox uh, gunpowder plot had, had just happened. Guy Fox had been, uh, he was the one that, uh, you, you, you know, the mask that you see with the mustache. People used to, the Occupy, uh, the Occupy movement used to, they oh, all wear those masks. Yeah. That's yes. the Guy Fox mask. He was the ringleader of the gunpowder plot in November 1605. And um, hmm. so they had just, just before the, uh, the outbreak of mutilation cases, they had put him up on the uh, executioner's stand and, and uh, uh, we're going to hang him uh, and then emasculate him, eviscerate him, draw and quarter him, break him into five pieces and send his body parts around the, the kingdom as a warning to anybody else who wanted to try to take out the new king. Uh, and... Um, the uh, Shakespeare was starting his uh, rehearsals for Macbeth, <laughs> and uh, all sorts of cool things are going on at that during that time frame. Uh, plus, there are witch trials and other things that were going on. I, I go into it in quite quite some detail in my uh, my book, Stalking the Herd. <laughs> Excellent. I was gonna say, yeah, you've got a couple of books. Uh, all, all this stuff is in. I don't know why it's blurry. Do I have the? It is blurry. You've got some sort I'll of filter on, possibly. It's called stalking the herd. Right. Um. And can people get that on Amazon? Yeah, yeah it's available at a truck stop near you. Uh. <laughs> so um. That's as that's as far back as I've been able to go. We we have you know some cases that uh, Charles Fort mentioned in. Uh, the damned that go from the 1820s, 1870s, 1880s, uh, early 1900s, and then there was a lull, and then there's cases from the 30s and 40s, and then cases from the early to mid 60s. But the granddaddy case of them all that uh, really is often cited as the first widely publicized or internationally known case was uh, Snippy the Horse, which happened to occur about 50 miles from where I was living in Colorado. What, what an ironic name, yeah. by the way. Well, Snippy actually was the name of the sire. <laughs> the horse's name was Lady, but, <laughs> you know, you have a horse that's found all snipped up. What are you going to call it, you know? <laughs> so the, the press, the name, you know, switched the names conveniently but that's oh it's kind of how it happens sometimes so uh one of the first people that i interviewed back when i was interviewing uh folks for my first article was uh, the the husband of the owner of the horse who uh i, I videotaped a, almost a two-hour interview i got the only real videotaped interview with him and uh just fascinating the stories that he he told about stuff that was going on in Colorado in the 60s. Uh, it, just amazing. Amazing amount of uh, UFO uh, events. And and in this case, a uh, strange, you know, strangely slain horse. But um, since I got involved in, uh, you know, 92, 93, I've been out on about 200 cases. Uh, wow. It's my least favorite thing in the world to do. Uh, I've made an attempt to move to states that don't have mutilation cases because <laughs> you know once once word got out that I was involved and and uh, interested in in helping the ranchers out uh, I would be getting calls uh, at all hours of the night and there were a few times where I would get there too late and this dead necrotic you know the rotting cow would It'd be impossible to escape the cadaverine molecules, and I'd go mm. home, and my girlfriend wouldn't let me in the house. She'd make me take a shower with a, you know, with a hose, and burn my clothes. Yeah. Uh, 
it's really disgusting, to be honest with you. Oh, I, I, I bet. don't uh, I don't like it at all. It's my least favorite thing to do in life, and uh, and I kind of burnt out on it, and and ended up moving to uh, uh, well, first to uh, Virginia Beach uh, for a couple of years, working on a a book project, and then I moved to Arizona, which is only had about 12, 15 cases in total. And then now I'm in upstate New York, uh, which has never had a case. <laughs> Nobody's going to call me and say, could you come and look at my cow? <laughs> yeah. So, well, that's good. I, 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 well, and that, I mean, it just continues, right? So you were talking yeah. a long, long time ago. Now here we are, present day. Yeah, and I'm involved in helping out with the, these new cases, uh, in Texas, Oklahoma, North Carolina, Kansas, Idaho, and Oregon. Which are most grief. recent so cases. The, the Texas one is what drew us to you. So well, there's eight Tim of them. brought up the... Eight of them. Yeah, Tim brought that Texas story to my attention. So, Tim, why don't you give us a little background on what you know, and then we'll have Chris dive into some knowledge for us. Definitely. So we do have some listeners that are very interested in the, this story out of Texas. You might have listener Taylor Barrett says, hey, I want to know more about the Texas case. And so here we are getting to that. And what drew my attention, Chris and CJ, to the Texas case was a most conspicuous Facebook post from the Madison County Sheriff's Department in Texas. And here it is. I'm going to put it on the screen. I've never seen a more <laughs> foreboding Facebook post from a sheriff's office. Suspicious <laughs> cattle deaths reported, and, and these are the most ominous-looking cows that I have ever seen. Now, I'd like to... I know a lot of people have not actually heard about this case, so I want to lead a, read a little bit. This is straight from the Madison County Sheriff's Office. This is headline April 19th, so just a couple of weeks ago, 2023. Ranchers advised a six-year-old longhorn cross cow had been found lying on her side deceased and mutilated on their ranch. A straight, clean cut with apparent precision had been made to remove the hide around the cow's mouth on one side, leaving the meat under the removed hide untouched. The tongue was also completely removed from the body with no blood spill. It was noted there were no signs of struggle and the grass around the cow was undisturbed. So we've got some of these classic signs here. No footprints or tire tracks were noted in the area. Ranchers also reported that no predators or birds would scavenge the remains of the cow, leaving it to decay untouched for several weeks. So th this is very interesting in their posts. They're getting into these kind of, you know, paranormal type of uh, cat, uh, uh, descriptions here in their Facebook post. While looking into the Longhorn Cross's death, five other similar occurrences involving four adult cows and one yearling were reported along the area of OSR running into Brazos County. Each incident occurred in different locations, pastures, and herds, which I thought was interesting. The other cows were found in the same condition. All right. Uh, on two of the five cows, a circular cut was made removing the anus and the external genitalia. This circular cut was made with the same precision as the cuts noted around the jaw lines of each cow. Just like the first, there were no signs of struggle or disturbance in the grass, no blood spill, no noticeable tracks, no predators or birds would scavenge the remains for several weeks. The cause of death of all six cows remains unknown. And Chris, this I found to be the most amazing part of this post from the Madison County Sheriff's Office multiple similar incidents have been reported across the united states and we are actively coordinating with other agencies to find answers and that blew my mind it clearly implies a connection to some sort of theory that all of these cases nationwide have in common what that which particular theory we, we are left to speculate on. Um, but what in the world, Chris, I'll just start with this. Could there, what other agencies could they be coordinating with right now? And what are your thoughts right here on the Facebook post in the Texas case? 
Well, it is unusual to uh, to have a local law enforcement make a big uh, make a big announcement like that. Um, generally, they um, they try to keep keep it quiet. I think part of that is uh, some sort of fear of of creating copycat uh, reactions out in the public. Uh, people, you know, hearing about that and saying, "Oh, well, let's go out and, and do that too." Um, I, it's highly unlikely that you're going to have, you know, rank amateurs going out and attempting to do one of these. It's not, it's not like cow tipping where you're going out and, you know, pushing over sleeping cows who are standing there, uh, you know, drowsy in a, in a field. It's way more difficult than that. Uh, and, um, generally law enforcement, uh, Especially on social media, I, uh, it's un- unprecedented. Uh, I've never heard of a of an announcement like this. As as to who the other agencies are, well, I just rattled off a whole list of states that are uh, ex- have experienced within the last couple three years uh, cases of this type, including around Fort Bragg uh, in North Carolina, where a couple cases around Fort Sill in uh, southern Oklahoma. We just had recently uh, a, a couple of uh, potential cases. One definitely, possibly a second. Um, in Kansas, we've had cases. Idaho, we had 23 cases uh, from 2019 through 2021 uh, in Oregon. Uh, so I'm sure with a little bit of digging, any uh, good investigator can find, you know, online, can find uh, uh, newspaper articles and notices of other cases. And and then what the law enforcement officials do is they, they compare notes with each other and, and attempt, to, uh, attempt to help each other out. Uh, in this case, uh, <laughs> it's uh, a little difficult to... Um, you know, come to any any sort of uh, consensus. Well, Chris, just so you know, we asked the investigator in charge of this case to come on the show, and not surprisingly, her voicemail was full, and we have not received an email back Carly. from her yet. Carly, yep. that's right, at Carly Foster. Uh, Foster. Yeah. And we have a list of Ron... Regeer says Chris is a good friend. I've known him for 25 years, knows his stuff. We can definitely tell that. But Chris, you mentioned to me that you might have had a chance to speak to Carly. I did. Um, she's pretty freaked out. I mean, as uh, any person with um, any sort of, <laughs> you know, uh, sympathetic nervous system, uh, it's, <laughs> right. you know, it's, it's kind of freaky and, and to be, uh, put in charge of, of an investigation like this uh, is, you know, you're almost doomed to failure. Uh, we've never had a person charged or convicted of a, of a cattle mutilation case uh, with one, two exceptions. Uh, back in 1902, they did charge and convict somebody for horse slashing in England. And um, I think it was in the 40s, there was another case uh, from back east here where they... Um, a person was charged with, um, you know, kind of a, how would I say, more of a intimate relationship. With well, th- that happens in England, hands. actually. Uh, <laughs> for some reason, they uh, they tend to like their horses in in ways that we don't, uh, we Thanks. can't particularly uh, fathom. Uh, so <laughs> that the horse molestation. Uh, scenario is an offshoot of the mutilation phenomenon, but it is different. And generally, you're not going to find that. Uh, well, let's put it this way: in England, uh, they've had quite a number of cases that could be chalked up to that, and also in in France, uh, and and actually fairly recently too. But Good get man. yeah. Um, so you know, to to be a to be somebody that um, is in charge of an investigation of this sort, um, 
the very fact that they publicized uh, the case tells me that she is inundated with uh, people calling, other uh, investigators calling, other uh, you know law enforcement officials who may have had uh, cases in their counties uh, that we don't know about, but uh, they want to find out what to do. You know, can can you advise us on how to how to do something, or uh, you know, can we help, or is there anything that we can do? So. There's a certain amount of networking and dovetailing of efforts that goes on, I think, within the, the law enforcement community. Having worked with quite a number of them, uh, you know, I've been a consultant for, I, I don't know, eight or nine states and uh, a number of uh, veterinarians and, and um, a, a couple of scientific, uh, you know, the research groups, the investigative groups of scientists. Uh, the Pinelandia Biophysics Lab. I, I did. Um, I helped them with a, a particular uh, excision site study. Uh, I also was a um, was signed up as a as a bird dog or a, a, you know someone that was uh, finding out about cases and then uh, sharing that information uh, in a timely manner with the National Institute for Discovery Sciences. Robert Bigelow's uh, science group that was oh boy, there's that name uh, again. Was active in the in the nineties. <laughs> well, they did uh, out of anybody who's ever been involved in this mystery, the the NIDS folks, uh, the veterinary pathologist George Onet, Doctor George Onet, and then Doctor Colm Kelleher, who uh, actually ended up running the OSAP uh, program for the government. Uh, and coordinated the research papers. I think uh, 40 research papers that were uh, were done for the Department of Defense uh, back in what 2010, I think 2012. Uh, mm. He he was uh, the coordinating uh, managing director of, of that effort, and um, on on the civilian side, and and we're talking some very very talented um, scientists and right. These guys, uh, they know their stuff, and um, I, had, I had been dogging them for years because they weren't publishing anything in the uh, mid-90s, and I you know, I was one of the very few people that was saying, well, maybe this isn't such a good idea, having these you know, well-funded people running around and scarfing up cases and then not sharing the results with the investigation community. Yeah, and, uh, that's a good point. And, well, I, you know, when... <laughs> When the ex-head of non-lethal weapons technology for the for the army emails you and and <laughs> with these strange kind of threatening sounding emails, you start to wonder, you know, question your motivations for dogging these people. And so, I ended up yeah. burying the hatchet really in the, in offering to help. And and so I I lined up all you know the six veterinarians that I had been working with locally in Colorado and all the law enforcement, I got everybody the, the protocols and, you know, lined up the funding through NIDS to have any of the lab work taken care of and and uh, didn't have a case for seven years. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so let's go back to Robert Bigelow. Yeah. He was the owner of Skinwalker Ranch for a bit. And we recently had the crew from current Skinwalker Ranch owners on our show to talk about things that are happening at the ranch. And we have a listener tonight who's curious about the mutilations on Skinwalker Ranch. Do you know anything about those mutilations that you could share with us? I, I do. I was the first outside uh, uh, you went to Basin researcher to go to the ranch. And, in 1996, before Big Lebowski, bought it. To be continued. You've been listening to All Things Unexplained. If you liked this podcast, please do give us a five-star rating and leave us a review. If you would like to hear more All Things Unexplained, be sure to follow us wherever you listen to your podcasts. Our show depends on the support of listeners like you. Find us on Venmo under the business accounts at Bigfoot UFO. If you can't get enough of us, please check us out at allthings-unexplained.com. A special thanks to our producer, 
director, sound mixer, editor, and the man who wears far too many hats. No, seriously, he wears a lot of hats. Dr. Tim Mounts. Without you, we couldn't keep the lights on. Thanks for listening to All Things Unexplained.